Professor Ann Fitzgerald, you wrote a paper that was very timely that came out exactly a year since the Northern Command attack by TPLF that started the war that we are seeing right now. I want to start with just the title because I thought that was very poignant. Failure to stand for democracy in Ethiopia has weakened democracy worldwide. What did you and the, your co-writer, Canadian leader and democracy expert Hugh Siegel mean by that? Well, I think the whole idea for a, a paper was marking the one year anniversary of this very tragic and long drawn out uh, in, in many people's views, unnecessary conflict and humanitarian tragedy. And knowing all the narratives that have been circulating and uh, that have been mixed, that have been cross analyzed, uh, that have been polarized, we wanted to bring some clarity to some of those arguments. and. Uh, we wanted to first start with democracy and how democracy has and has not played out on the ground in Ethiopia, how we as the West stand for democracy and the values that it represents, and uh, what does it mean in terms of taking democracy forward. So uh, we looked at what had happened and the basics of what had happened, uh, which was an unprovoked attack on um, all the outposts of the Northern Command uh, federal military base. And um, that elicited a response, which in our view, and knowing what we know about legislation governing things like military aid to the civil authorities, uh, is what any civilized country would do to neutralize a threat as large as the one that hit Ethiopia on the 3rd and the 4th of November. Um, and instead of having allies support that in diplomatic terms, even let alone security and military terms, um, Ethiopia was vilified. The leader was vilified. Uh, they were vilified for using a neighbor to help with the effort, a neighbor that, let's not forget, was attacked itself by rocket uh, missiles into its capital city. And um, a world which was hit by a digital narrative that was staged by a very, very well-resourced and organized propaganda network. This propaganda network is not new. It has been existing for a long time, but it was bolstered with layers of an insurgency model to have a very powerful effect on the world. And the world became shell-shocked because there were two different accounts of something that happened on the ground, uh, something that the perpetrator had admitted to. So the paper was just really to say that if this is how we support the projection of democracy, then it's a big win for the authoritarians like um, China, like Russia, who believe that the democratic model does uh, fail on several accounts. And one of those accounts is based on uh, the, their reliability as, as an ally to stand with. And when what it appears to be uh, on the ground uh, that we're seeing on the ground is um, a reward being extended to um, a, a nationally declared terrorist group um, and no punitive measures being lodged against that terrorist group, then for a country, um, whose population, 80% of which was eligible to vote in a recent election, came out and voted predominantly for the leader currently in power. If that's the party that the world is standing with, rather than this democratic leader in a legitimate, transparent, fair, and pretty good for African and Ethiopian standards election, then there's no hope for democracy. So that's what we were the point we were trying to make to bring it back to basics, to review exactly what happened based on the evidence and to look at the bigger implications, which is the job of an academic, you know, looking at propositions for the future. Right, that's what you would think of a lot of academics and yet it seems the more prevalent approach is one that's more political, that has chosen sides. And in this case, the side of an armed insurgency you know, it feels like it's it's the worst now because it happens to uh, be happening to a country that I have a connection to, but I, I know too much to know that that's not 
the case in terms of it not happening to other countries, but has it gotten worse in terms of diplomacy on the world stage or has it always been like this? I think it's got worse. I think it's become worse and it's become worsened because of the digital world and the different domains. So where threats in the past to national security of countries really played out on the ground and you know, maybe with, with a further reach um, by way of foreign agents, intelligence agents, infiltration agents, et cetera. It's, it's what we would call multi-platform now, multifaceted, multi-domain. So um, that's the kind of conflict we're facing and an insurgency model of warfare that um, one side of the conflict in Ethiopia has, has um, supported and taken forward is layered with those multifaceted platforms. Um, and there's you know, an element going on in the virtual space, there's an element going on on the ground, but for both elements, they need for insurgency warfare, something we call auxiliary support. And that often requires friends, external actors, um, and, and yeah, we're saying, seeing different people implicated, different people brought into it. Um, you know, even my children have said to me, oh, you know, Instagram says this, we should support this. And, um, you know, you have to intercept these things, but part of what goes on is the infiltration of civil society too. You know, institutions are targeted, universities are targeted, credible organizations um, are, 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 are brought a case, a case that seems very passionate, seems very worthy, um, but, you know, is, is, is lacking in essential evidence-based ingredients that should be hosted in the research world. So, that's that to me is what we're seeing that has worsened, um, uh, not worsened, but that has challenged the diplomatic world. Yeah, to your point, I find that when we're talking to congressional leaders or an expert in a different field, uh, we're working up against already a false narrative. So we're trying to poke holes in it as opposed to them starting with a clean state, not being biased and just being able to hear our story because one of the uh, uh, insurgency tools, as you said, is social media and the digital space. And, and uh, those who are pro TPLF have already gotten to certain people. And now you're having to defend or refute certain narratives that aren't true to begin with. So yeah, it, it's really seems like it's, it's, it's very challenging. Another point you made in the paper is had the same incident been visited upon a NATO member state, no one would have questioned what the Ethiopian government was doing. What, how would it have been different? Has this been a NATO member state? And is it about the, the economics that the, the member states have more money or what would be the factors that would make the international world treat Ethiopia differently had it been an, a NATO member state? Well, I don't know the answer to your second question, what is it about Ethiopia that, that makes it in a whole different classification category than other member states, but knowing what I know about NATO doctrine, NATO guidance, um, standard operating procedures, had something like that happened anywhere? I mean, had it happened here in the country that I live in, Canada, say if, a, if an element of the Alberta uh, provincial police um, went rogue on the armed forces training base in that same province. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very convinced that the leader of this country would deploy all national instruments of power to defuse that threat, neutralize the threat completely. Um, you know, we saw this happen in response to different terrorist strikes that affected, you know, buses in London some years ago that um, uh, affected the targeting of an MP in the UK very recently, um, um, challenges that, that France has had to deal with over the last few years. And none of those responses were called into question. Um, and, and NATO has standard practices around something called military aid to the civil authorities. And in fact, it doesn't just adopt those practices itself. It, it trains based on those practices, trains different partner countries and has done across um, Central Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe and also African countries. The militaries in Africa 
under defense diplomacy schemes. So, and just to come back to a point that you were saying about information and always, you know, this, the realities of social media, but also insurgency warfare, the reason why public affairs and information management is so critical as an instrument of power nationally is that if you are constantly defending yourself against the charges being laid at your doorstep, as you referred to with, with meetings with congressional members, then it's almost reinforcing the insurgents narrative, that initial narrative, because you're, you're you know, catering for the wolves at the door all the time instead of rising up and projecting these strategic messages. And in my view, that's something that Ethiopia didn't get right as, as a national government at the front end. It, it was weak in this area. It didn't stay ahead of the information curve. Um, okay, its capacity was being stripped and, and pressured by what was going on in the ground, but it just you know underscores the importance of information. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think, between the international community being shell-shocked with having two different narratives thrown at it and not knowing where to land in some cases between those two narratives that were highly, highly polarized um, and not putting their support behind a democratic, legitimately elected government, um, it, was, it was a dark hour for diplomacy. Yeah, I think it's going to be embarrassing in the long run, this narrative of genocide that the TPLF and Tigrayan activists have woven. But to your point and to what we're talking about now, you almost can't not sound crazy when you're saying this isn't a genocide, that's fake. Like that in and of itself puts you in the position, like you said, where you're having to work with the initial major claim. And it just sounds like you are reinforcing what they're saying because it's almost difficult to imagine that an entity would say something is a genocide when they are driving youth and forcing youth into other regions to kill other people. So absolutely, I think no one, no matter how much they support the, even the Ethiopian federal government would say that they got the information part uh, right, but hopefully in the future, that's something that they will work on. Um, because you have, uh, you, you know, I think TPLF well, um, this isn't necessarily something that you wrote about in your paper, but I'm, I'm curious what you think in terms of, could this group even be a reliable ally? I know maybe it was for the last 27 years for some countries, but at this point, after so many of the season members have died for different reasons, Prime Minister Melissanawi is not there. We don't even know who's really running the show and making these really poor decisions. Can they be a reliable partner or are they just going to be a belligerent entity that will end up uh, you know, embarrassing even the very people that are backing them now? Well, I think if they are capable of doing what was done to the Northern Command and capable of planning for, I mean, it takes a long time to not just plan something like that, but to, to be ready to execute it. There's this thing that we talk about in defense and security studies called the invisible capacity. And that's like the war fighting spirit. You need to be really um, convinced that your leadership that the objectives of your leadership are sound and worthy. And there's a buildup to that, you know, a not dissimilar to what the objective of pep rallies are at colleges before big games, big sports games. You've got to build that up. You've got to keep your people with you. And for an insurgency, that's society writ large, right? War amongst the people. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, there's there's a bit of a basic trust issue that's that's gone in some camps, and I think this is where you have to look at the TPLF and realize that uh, part of its model, of course, was was really forcing people uh, at worst and strongly encouraging uh, in a forceful way other people at best to be a party member. I mean, the, the whole Marxist-Leninist ideology or ideological basis of the TPLF and its formation was vanguard politics, which meant you were a, 
the people worked for the party instead of the party working for the people. So um, that culture is not part of a democratic pathway at all, right? And it's not the pathway that the Ethiopian people, the majority of the Ethiopian people have voted for. So um, I would say that one of the basics that has to come to Tigray is plural politics and awareness creation of, of what plural politics is all about, how the people need to be convinced that politics has to work for them and not the opposite. And so diverse views, um, having a voice, having representation, all of those things. So if there is a, a group, and I'm sure there is a group of moderate voices, um, you know, I've had friends um, uh, who, who have been TPLF party members who I've spoken to, who have reached out. Um, we do hear of splinters happening in the diaspora and on the ground. So, and this was inevitable. This happens with rebel insurrectionist movements and insurgencies. And I think there's probably, you know, there's, there's likely to be several groups of moderate voices that can rise up, form as a political entity, form by way of the minimal requirements for a political party to form in Ethiopia and, and play a part in the, in the region's future and the country's future. So I don't think it's, it's, it's really, can we rely on this strategic leadership command and control group? Uh, no, I would say we can't, but there is a wider population that became affiliated with the party because they had to, that played no part in the decision-making of this conflict. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's what one of the evil genius of it all is that it's not just this core group that's considered part of TPLF. It's so many people. It's people that I know that are good people that have were just doing their jobs in whatever capacity. And so they've sort of now gone even beyond the official members and have driven in all this diaspora and scholars who just for different reasons didn't fully understand the context. So yeah, it, it, it's. I always ask the question, who is making the decisions? Because it can't be, you know, people like Gita Chorada. I don't think so. That's not the sense that I get from who uh, he was. And so it just seems like there's sort of the invisible figures behind the scenes that are uh, doing the most damage. And then you've got the faces that people for different reasons um, find charming or like that are actually the, the face of it. And then a lot of innocent people that are getting wrapped up and getting killed um, as well. I'll have one more question and I'll open it up to you to, to say any uh, last minute things. Uh, one of the other points you made in the paper is that this has made other African states fear similar treatment. I imagine there are uh, other states watching and saying, yeah, this could happen to us. Can you just give us a little bit more context and what you mean by that? Well, I think that a lot of the Western policies on Ethiopia at the moment are either non-existent and being built by the day, or um, they are short-termist in thinking, or else you wouldn't have seen many of the issues that did go to the UN Security Council, um, I think in nine or 10 meetings, go to the UN Security Council. Like that's the uppermost organ of peace and security issues in the world. And um, a national water infrastructure project shouldn't end up on the desk of the UN Security Council. Um, so I think that there is some geopolitic, uh, geopolitical trends that, that give cause for concern. Uh, the, the sanctions that are being lodged as well are a reminder that really all we've seen happen across the geopolitical space is one extreme or the other, either you know, calls of concern, calls of condemnation, calls of support in some camps towards the Ethiopian government, or we go right to the other end of the spectrum and we see harsh sanctions being lodged, calls of genocide, uh, harsh accusatory words being used. But there's a lot of things in the middle that we could be doing too. And there's no doubt that some countries are doing some things quietly and in support of, you know, in technical support capacities. But, you know, there's things like reconciliation, dialogue, um, political reconciliation, um, things that 
should be supporting democratic transitions. I mean, we, we see some very difficult and challenging democratic transitions taking place in other parts of the world like um, Myanmar uh, and the challenges that Aung San Suu Kyi faces with the heavy hand of the Tamadol military that still holds um, uh, uh, the bulk of the votes in parliament. So she can't really pass anything in parliament without their support and look what's happened you know, she's been put under house arrest again. So this is how we're seeing the response to Ethiopia. And um, the question you asked about my paper, what, uh, the, what how did I finish it? it was, uh, th this has made other African states fear similar treatment. Yes. So um, when a country like Ethiopia gets vilified for wanting to use its share of the Nile waters, which is, by the way, 85%, um, then why this is becoming a global security threat and something which should be uh, quashed by other more powerful states is something that other African countries should be concerned about. Um, when we see efforts of global powers to go around to regional hegemons on the continent to discuss the case of Ethiopia, to share concern about their position on Ethiopia and um, to, to, to influence that way, and then to see some of those African actors and their response play out in a way that's not very sub-Saharan African as we know it, that gives more cause for concern. And, um, you know, I think one thing that we have seen in the past is that when Sub-Saharan Africa has to come together, it does come together. And uh, we saw with the formation of Prime Minister Abiy's new government, a real show of support. I think there, were, there was lots of representation there from, Af from Africa. But um, the Sudan-Ethiopia relationship is one that I've been very worried about. The relationship over the years has been very good. And for a global leader like the US that has imposed sanctions on Sudan for so long that crippled the Sudanese economy, that the origin for which concerned uh, Osama bin Laden, who ended up being miles away from Sudan in Pakistan, then to all of a sudden turn around and have this close relationship with it um, and to forge even a closer relationship through a triangular partnership with, Ethiopia, with Egypt um, to encourage Egypt to support Sudan's military modernization, to encourage uh, joint military exercises days after a conflict breaks out next door, uh, with, with very um, suggesting titles like Nile Eagle <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is, is not really fair, is it? It's, it's, it's not helpful. It's not as helpful as Ethiopia has been to Sudan in the past. Let's not forget that Abiy Ahmed himself went over and brokered the, the um, transitional government arrangement in Sudan after several attempts helped by others had failed. And it won Prime Minister Abiy a standing ovation in, um, in, in the parliament of Sudan. So there, it just seems to be a story that couldn't even be written. Uh, it, in some days, I feel that what's happening in the Horn of Africa is, is surreal. Other days seem more realistic, um, but I think grounding it back uh, in the context of the democratic values we're all supposed to come together based on um, you know, the African Union, NATO, the United Nations, the EU, what brings us all together is this notion of shared common values. Values like political democracy, rule of law, favorable world order, basic human rights and freedoms. Um, and there seems to be a bit of selective application of these going on and, well, a liberal application. So um, we, we were just trying to ground the paper back in the roots of the conflict, what's happened, how 
the world has responded and how that calls into question fundamental basics of democracy. Yeah, and it was, you know, it's it just in, in a sea of lies and in a sea of warmongering, I think a paper like that, it was just so relieving for me um, to read. I'm going to open it up to you just to kind of say anything that you're not, you normally don't get in because maybe it doesn't get asked to you, but you've been working on this for a long time. You know Ethiopia, you know the TPLF and the political makeup of that country. Uh, what, what, what's uh, something that you would like to say that, that, that I didn't ask you? Well, I think um, just to send out a, a reminder to everyone with eyes and ears on Ethiopia at the moment and the pulse of a, such a wonderful country and uh, the, the people and the government to, to bear in mind that what's happened over the last year has come with some heavy costs, some, some destructive implications. All of that is going to take a lot of time to repair. And all of that is going to require um, a, a financial, an emotional, uh, a societal investment um, that, that must be galvanized for years to come to make this better. So I would just appeal to the government not to shortchange the effort that is required to sew this wonderful country completely back together again and to ensure that communities reconcile with each other, the right kind and the right levels of dialogue is supported and for this not to be rushed. I know sometimes economic reforms and security reforms and other policies um, need to be rushed through, but that this one needs to be fully invested in and time taken to make sure it's the right kind of model. I think the only other thing that I would say, Hermela, is, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, is um, that uh, our hearts are with all of those communities affected by the conflict um, communities in Tigray, Amhara and Afar in particular, but elsewhere as well, um, communities that have been affected by the offshoots of this conflict and the way um, uh, related aspects of the conflict have popped up elsewhere. And uh, it's especially poignant this week as we mark uh, one year on from the start of this very unfortunate and destructive conflict a year ago. So. Um, my thoughts and prayers are with the people, are with the country, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. It's hard to imagine. It's been a whole year. I called your paper sober and sobering. This conversation was also sober and sobering. So thank you so much for your time, Professor Ann Fitzgerald. Thank you so much. Pleasure.